All right, so Mother's Day. I promised myself that I wouldn't get emotional today, so I'm going to really be working hard on that. Mother's Day, uh, we, we saw the video. It's not always like that, is it? For some, maybe it is, but for some, maybe it's not. M- Mother's Day has, has such an emotional effect on so many, and s- such a different effect on so many people, depending on your situation. And so uh, it's interesting, as we think and talk about motherhood, we look at those, those characteristics of motherhood, and yet we also know that there's no perfect mother. In the Bible, we find all these examples of mothers who have either blown it or mothers who are messed up or had trouble. Think about the mother of all mothers. Who's that? Well, I would say Eve. Yeah, trick question. The mother of all mothers, Eve, she really blew it, right? So all of us are suffering because Eve really, really blew it. And then of course, we have Lot's wife. What happened to her? She turned into a pillar of salt because she looked back to Sodom and Gomorrah when she was supposed to go away, and she was just longing and, and holding on to, to sin and the world and all those things. And well, that would be a bummer if you're here on a Mother's Day and your mother turned into a pillar of salt and <laughs> you're trying to celebrate Mother's Day. That would be a bummer go out to lunch and somebody pours salt on their food and you're like, oh, dang it. I wonder if that's mom. (laughs) And then, of course, there's Job's wife who basically told Job to curse God and die. So we do have those impressions and those examples which tell us that there's no perfection in the world. There's nothing perfect But there is something about mothers. There's something about the instincts of mothers that tell us a lot about God. And you know, one of the proofs about God is some of the characteristics that we have being people made in his image. The fact that as human beings, we have a a moral compass. Everybody has a moral compass compass, although it may be different, but everybody has a sense of right and wrong. Well, that's because we are made in the image of God. So a human's being, their desire to love and be loved is because we are made in the image of God. The fact that we're generally social people, people who want to connect with other people, those are things that tell us that, that this God that we know and learn about and understand in the Bible that he has certain attributes and certain characteristics. Well, as mothers, mothers have been given very specific things for us that we can clue in on that tell us some things about God that are absolutely wonderful. And so you think about this first mother who was, who was that again? You think about Eve and how she came to be. It was like, you know, God took something out of Adam and made Eve, right? You guys know the story? That's interesting to me because perhaps what was taken out of Adam was what Eve was made from are some of the reasons that women can't understand why men can't understand. It's because it's not there anymore. And God took that out and he made Eve. And women are, have a hard time understanding why men are so dense and insensitive and, and can't understand. Well, it's not there anymore. And God made you out of that. And that's wonderful and beautiful. And yet, that's why the Bible says, for the husband to dwell with the wife with what? Understanding. Because it takes supernatural ability from God to understand that which was taken out of the man. But the mother, the the instinct of a mother, 
is very powerful. And I think it's interesting that, that God chose a woman to, to carry the human race, to, to be that which would bear life. The, the woman, if it were a man, he would have probably forgot that he was pregnant. He <laughs> probably would have gone out and done stunts and things that would be harmful to the baby, not realizing the danger. We can see the genius of God in, in the way he's made a mother and the way he's allowed a mother to carry a child. There's five things I want to look at that help us to understand the heart of God seen in the heart of a mother. One is the, the passion for life. Number two is the tenderness that we see in mothers. Number three is their devotion. Number four is their nurturing. And number five is how protective they are. And we're going to look at that through Hannah in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1. So we're going to pick up the story in verse 8. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8, looking at Hannah, we pick up the scene with Hannah. She is broken. She was uh, having trouble eating. She was upset. God, the Bible says that God closed her womb and she was unable to have children. The first point we see is that there is a, an instinctual desire of a woman to desire to have life, to bear life, to support life, encourage life, to nurture life, and tend to life. And that is a very powerful feeling and emotion. And so when Hannah wasn't able to do that, like so many mothers who are not able to have children, that's a, a grief above all griefs. Notice the story, we pick it up in verse 8, the grieving Hannah it says, then uh, Elkanan, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So there's the insensitivity of her husband, right? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's the problem? You have me. How could you be so upset? I mean, I, me. I'm way better than 10 sons. And yet she's brokenhearted. It's hard for me to relate, and probably to a lot of, a lot of men, to exactly how she would feel. And I, I bet a lot of mothers here know what that's like. But there is, in women, especially mothers, there's this, this intense desire and passion for life that God's put in them. So Hannah arose, verse 9, she arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. Interesting term. Bitterness of soul, the deepest part of her was aching and hurting because of this longing and desire. And what she did with that pain, I think is so appropriate that she prayed. She cried out to the Lord. And she cried out to the Lord in a, in a way where where prayers are really meaningful. Prayers are really connective. And that's the place of brokenness and hurt in the deepest part of who we are. And she's praying to the Lord in that condition. In verse 11, it says, she made a, a vow and she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, another term there. She had bitterness of soul, and now she felt afflicted. And she said, if you remember me and not forget your maidservant, 
but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. What does that mean? Basically, she's saying, I will dedicate and devote this child to you. This is interesting because as she was doing that, this was something they called the Nazarite vow. This is something that Samson was a Nazarite. So they're these were, these were men that were dedicated to serve the Lord. So this meant that she would give her son, if God granted her a son, that she would give her son over to the Lord. And we'll see that develop here, but you, do you see the, the power of what's going on here? The power of how God made a mother, that, that their desire is for life, that their desire is want to bring forth life. And these their desires of a woman, these are the desires of a mother, and these are the desires of Jesus Christ. Jesus knew what it felt like, didn't he, to be lonely, rejected, neglected, unappreciated, and taken for granted. We have this picture of Hannah sort of alone in her suffering. She had some things that, that her husband couldn't really understand. And in that suffering, she took it to the Lord. The, there are times when we have sufferings in our heart, especially the sufferings of a mother for their children. The, the suffering for the desire for a mother to want to see their children do well. The hurt and the pain that a mother has when their child is not doing well. The, the secret hurts, the things that they suffer with in silence, these are all the same things that Jesus suffered with as well. He knew what it felt like to be lowly and discouraged because of his passion for life, wanting to see others live in the fullness of life. This was a certain distinct pain that he carried that mothers reflect. The Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And that he came to give life and that more abundantly. And he was willing to give his own life for others. And so we see in mothers this passion for life and it tells us the passion of Jesus Christ for our lives. The intense desire that Jesus has for you and I today to have abundant life, eternal life, life of forgiveness and power and goodness and glory that, that he was willing to give his life for. It's an amazing, powerful thing that God has given to a woman. The second point is not only do mothers have this, this passion for life, but there's a certain tenderness that mothers have. I think we would all agree that mothers have this ability to show gentleness, concern, and sympathy. It's a, it's a, I would call it an inviting softness is the way I looked at it and thought about it. That, that moms just have this tenderness and they're the ones usually where we go when we are hurt or afraid, when we need a soft lap or a caring hug, an understanding ear and a compassionate heart, and we, when we are in trouble or we just need to talk. I don't know about you, and um, no offense to my dad back there, but when something went wrong, it was mom that I always wanted to talk to. It was mom that I always knew that if spankings were going to come, I'd rather have her do it. <laughs> yes, my parents did spank me. And I had to hold back laughter when my mom would spank me because it didn't hurt at all. <laughs> me and my brother would look at each other and, and try not to laugh and act like it really hurt, but it didn't. But there is something about the tenderness of a mother. Look in verse 12. 
And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli, he was the priest, he, he watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart and her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So she's there praying. And here's the priest is like, she's out of her mind. She's been getting hammered before she's coming and worshiping the Lord. Very misunderstood. So Eli, in verse 14, he says to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of, here it is again, a sorrowful spirit. You see that, that deep pain. I, I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And I'm sure many a mother know that pain. The pain that is uh, misunderstood and confused. The pain of a, a mother that's desperate and has such a tender and sensitive heart with such a great desire for others, especially her own. Even the priest didn't know what was going on. In verse 16, do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. She says, Eli the priest, she says, I am, I am praying to the Lord. My lips are moving and there's a lot going inside of my heart. I'm communicating to God in my heart. And just because you don't hear the sounds out of my lips. You don't understand my pain and my hurt and my anguish. Please don't misunderstand me. In verse 17, Eli answered her and he said, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. So we see the tenderness of a mother's heart, which is also makes her susceptible to a unique sort of pain, an often misunderstood pain, a pain that a, a mother carries because of that sensitivity that she has in general to others, especially her own. And this is the, the tenderness that we see in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed, and as he prayed, his sweat filled with blood. The anguish of his heart, the intensity of his prayers were so great that many a mother here knows the intensity of a prayer of a tender heart that only knows to go to the Lord that pours out her heart to the Lord. This was the heart of Jesus. Imagine praying to such an extent where now you're bleeding sweat. That's a sign of, of capillaries bursting where your sweat glands are. So this is a, a picture of intense prayer and grief and power that comes from that tender heart. Jesus is tender hearted to us this morning. Jesus is praying for us at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, when he looked out at the people, the masses of people, he would see them as people that were like sheep without a shepherd. When he saw people disconnected from their origin, disconnected from their creator, disconnected from everything that makes sense, disconnected from the one who loves them, disconnected from the one who died for them, disconnected to the one who wants to give them life. He was mourning and in anguish and upset. That's the heart of the Lord for us. Jesus wept over Lazarus. 
when he came and he saw the dead body of Lazarus. The understanding, the realization, the, the apprehension of, of sin and death and what sin has done to us and how it hurts us as he saw the family members just so mourning and grieving over Lazarus, it caused Jesus to grieve, to weep as well. This is the heart of Jesus for us, that he grieves over us and our rebellion against him, knowing that we've been caught up in darkness rather than the light that he offers. This is that the type of pain that a mother sees when their child is going off the deep end. They see their child straying, when they see their child going down a path where they know where it's going to lead, there's, there's not a pain like that because this is the pain that Jesus Christ feels for us when we go away from the truth and the light and that which will set us free. Jesus had a tender heart. You may remember that he was tired and weary, and yet he had a, a following coming after him. His disciples said, hey, send them all home. You're tired. We're tired. We don't want to deal with them. And Jesus said, no. Bring them here. Let us feed them. Remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Jesus was never too busy. He is never too tired. He is never too preoccupied to take care of those people who were in need. Jesus hurt for the least, the last, and the lost. Jesus had compassion for those who the world would cast off. Jesus would have a tender heart for those that pe other people would hate, for the rejects and the outcasts. These were Jesus' friends. Jesus healed on the Sabbath, putting people above laws and rules, being more concerned about an individual than he would about a law or the rule. Jesus spent time with sinners. You may remember the time where he went and sought out the Samaritan woman the woman who had to go and, and get water from the well at a time where nobody else was there because she was a, a woman that was scorned, a woman that was a half-breed, a woman that was not looked upon well, and yet Jesus sought her out. That's our Lord. Jesus defended the woman caught in adultery, and the tender heart of Jesus tells us Today, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. A mother knows that. A mother knows the desire to want to bring people, especially those who she loves, especially her children, into the great graces of Jesus Christ, because this is a reflection of who Jesus is. Not only do mothers reflect the heart of Jesus through a passion for life and a great tender heart, we also see that in their devotion, in their devotion to their children. Devotion simply means a, a loving, loyal attitude. I say that's a great term to sum up a mother, wouldn't you? They're there through thick and thin. Remember Jesus' mother at the cross. You ever think about how hard that would be? Jesus' mother at the cross. He was there in her household from a baby, taking care of him, nurturing him, loving him, caring for him, providing for him. And then she sees him hanging there on a cross. Imagine a, a mother, the heart of a mother, and her devotion to her child that wouldn't leave his side when others did. The devotion of a mother that would sit there and watch her son be crucified, who would watch every last bit of blood pour out of him. That mother who 
at that time didn't fully realize that he was going to raise again from the dead. But this devoted mother sticking there to her son through thick and thin. Mothers put up with being treated poorly, don't they? A lot of us, when we get older, we realize what we put our mothers through. Maybe today is a good, good day to say we're sorry for that. <laughs> we put our mothers through a lot. And I know our mothers suffer a lot in silence. The pain that a devoted mother feels for her children is the pain of Jesus Christ for us. Devoted mothers see their children through times of failure as well as times of success. And a devoted mother, they never give up on us. Amen? Look at verse 19. Then they rose early in the morning and they worshiped before the Lord. I love that. Isn't that a great picture of Hannah? Picture we have of Hannah as a, a praying woman, a devoted woman to her husband, a devoted woman to the Lord. And with child, without child, in great times and in bad times, we see a consistency of her, don't we? The consistency is that she is a worshiper of the Lord. We see that, that thread of consistency running through her life. And so in verse 20, she's worshiping the Lord, and it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son. Hmm. And called his name Samuel, because it says, I have asked for him from the Lord. So we have this, this picture of a devoted mother and a devoted servant of the Lord. Do you remember when Jesus said, I must be about my father's business? Jesus was consistently devoted to fulfilling the calling and the plan that God had for his life. Do you remember in Matthew 4, Jesus was tempted not to follow through with that plan. Jesus was tempted to act on his own behalf according to his own plan and his own will. And Jesus stayed the course because he was devoted to something greater and higher. He was devoted to the Father's plan and the Father's will. Aren't you glad? And many a mother know that the temptation to do their own thing and to live for themselves and stray from the truth and, and finally say, you know, I have to do something for me, which in many cases is true, but never the sacrifice of the relationship with God and their care for their children. A devoted mother is amazing because she shows us like Jesus, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Jesus never gives up on us and Jesus isn't ashamed of us. Maybe one of the most characteristic feelings of a mother is failure. Most mothers genuinely feel like they're failing all the time. And it's because of the things that I've said before, their deep burden, love, tenderness, devotion, and passion for life that causes them to feel like that. And that feeling then gives us an idea of what Jesus had to do to save us, of how low he had to go, of how stripped he had to become, of, of what Jesus went through to take our sins and die for us. Imagine the incredible love and devotion to us. To me, that's mind-blowing. But mothers then, their fourth point is they have this incredible nurturing ability. 
Nurturing just means to uh, care for and encourage the growth and development of. So you, you see a mother and you, you see the tender, devoted, passionate life towards their children. And it, it brings about this, this nurturing quality. It's so healthy for kids that they encourage development and growth in just the right way and, and often knowing just how to do that. I love that nurturing aspect of moms. I love to see a mom just with their child and caring for them. Oftentimes in our society with so many things going on and they're putting food in this mouth and they're signing papers with this hand and they're running to the store in this area. of their life. It's just so crazy and yet you see this, this affection and tenderness that mothers have. This nurturing is, is that the, the mother always wants what's best for us. They're our biggest cheerleaders and biggest fans. They help us. And of course, as we mentioned before, they're heartbroken for us often. Notice in verse 21. It says, Now the man, the husband, Elkanan, and all his house, they went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So her husband said to her, do, you, do what seems best to you, wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. So we, we see this picture, and here's, here's how the story starts to unfold to where a lot of moms, they feel this. You feel as a, as a mom, a lot of times it's like you're in the process of letting your child go constantly. She's, she's nursing her child, but she knows once she presents them, him to the priest, that he's now, he now belongs to the priest. Remember, she made that vow. She made that vow so that he would be raised in the temple as a Nazarite, as a man of God in a very detailed, specific way. And yet we, we see this desire of her to want what's best for the child and what, was she, what she had committed to the Lord. And this is often another pain that parents feel. That connection that they have to the child is a connection that they also have to let go and release and is very difficult for a mother. But a, a mother that has the, the child's best interest and God's plan and God's will above her own. We, we see that she was taking care of the child specifically and purposely for the improvement and development and ultimate highest good for that child. And that's a big sacrifice. And some of us as, as parents, we're, we have a tension this, this tightrope that we walk of, of allowing our kids a little rope, a little responsibility, a little growth, and knowing that tension of how much to give and how much to keep, it's a process of, of letting go of control, isn't it? It's a process of trusting them into the hands of the Lord. But we see this quality in Jesus. Jesus was nurturing. Jesus, you remember, he said, don't forbid the little children to come to me. I picture little kids just sitting on Jesus' lap and him playing with them, loving them, encouraging them, and setting the foundation for them to know who he really truly was. Jesus would spend time with his disciples. I love reading through the Gospels and looking at the time he spent and how... Um, tender and loving and caring and compassionate those times were, but also how truthful and real those times were. 
Jesus took care of their needs. He healed the sick. He forgave at the cross. I like the story of his restoration of Peter. He blessed his enemies. He taught, he prayed, he loved and encouraged. This is a, a heart of a mother, which is the heart of Jesus. And then the last point we see here in verse 24. You ever want to get on the wrong side of a mom? Mess with their kids. You know how they have, they say there's those five love languages. Have you ever heard of that? It's a book out, you know, five love languages, how a person likes to be loved. I think the sixth one, if you ever want to get on the good side of a mom, say good stuff about their kids. You, you're in forever. Just tell them how awesome their kids are and you'll be speaking their love language. Because moms are protective, right? Don't mess with the mama bear. Have you ever heard that before? Fiercely protective of their children's best interest and protective of, of God's plan, even at their own personal cost. Mothers love us to death. It's a sacrificial love. And notice this last section, verse 24. It says, now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bowls, some flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli the priest. And, and she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition of which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worship the Lord together. That's hard, isn't it? What a perspective on children. Children are a heritage from God. Ultimately, they are God's. If you're a parent, you know what you are? You're a steward of God's most precious possession. You are to take care of that precious possession as if you were taking care of God's valuable jewelry or treasures. But see here, she let him go. She was so protective of him. But a lot of times we think of that protection in a way where, where we just shield them from everything. But let me just suggest to you, part of our protecting our children is also letting them go. Letting them go into God's hands, into God's will, into God's truth. Letting them go to be all that God has for them to be. And if you're a parent struggling with some of those issues, ask God for the strength to help you let go appropriately when it's appropriate. And so you see, and he was young, so see how hard that was. But you know what finally it tells us? Jesus is so protective over us. Jesus said that no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus said that nothing will separate us from the love of God. And that is the heart of our Lord watching over us as his children and his flock until the day that he finally takes us home. He will make sure, if we're a child of God, that we will get there. And so we see, like anything else, we live in a broken world. And we have a, a lot of hurt, hurt souls and hurt feelings and, and a lot of uh, things that we've experienced, good and bad through motherhood. And overarching all of that, we just sometimes through mothers, we get a little glimpse of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when we do, we praise God for who he is. And if you're here this morning and, and, and you're struggling with the whole mother thing, maybe you don't have a good relationship with your mother. Maybe your mother has passed away. Maybe this is a, a hard day for you. Whatever that may be. Maybe you've been not a very good mother. I want to encourage you today. Jesus makes up for all our failures. Christ is the perfect one, and we are not. And I want to encourage you this morning to take all your cares and concerns to Jesus Christ, the perfect one. He is perfect, so we don't have to. And if you need to forgive this morning, maybe you need to take a step of faith and, and forgive. God will give you the strength to do that. The Psalm 73, 26 says this, My heart and flesh are weak, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. This Mother's Day, right before we take communion, just please know and understand the importance of who Christ is, what he has done for us, and what he invites us to. 